today we are on part number two of our series entitled, God Is That You? Last week, um, we started this series and we talked about tuning in. And this week, uh, the title of the message is Cutting Through the Noise. One of the biggest questions that Christians ask is, how do I know it's really God speaking to me? It's one of the greatest questions that people want to know the answer to. So last week, before we jumped into hearing his voice, we talked about tuning in. And we started this entire series with an analogy. I talked about how radio stations are here in Sacramento that are sending out their messages through the airwaves 24 hours a day, seven days a week. While I'm speaking to you right now, there are radio stations that are broadcasting their messages throughout the city at this very moment. In order for us to hear them, how many of you know we have to tune into the right frequency in order to receive the message that they're trying to send? I am here to tell you that God is always working. He's always moving. He is speaking. And one of the keys for us as believers is we have to learn how to tune into the right frequency so that we can hear his voice. So last week, we talked about three things that will help us tune in to the voice of God. Number one, here it is. Thank you, have it in your notes. The first thing you have to do is this. You have to believe God wants to speak to you. There are a lot of believers that, that just, they don't believe God wants to speak to them because they feel they don't measure up. They're not worthy. They're always falling short. So maybe God wants to speak to me through somebody else communicating the message. And I'm here to tell you that's a lie from the enemy. God wants to speak to you directly. He tore the veil in two and he called you to come into his presence so that you could have audience with him. So first of all, you have to come by faith and you have to believe that God wants to speak to you. How many of you want to be able to hear the voice of God? Raise your hand. How many of you believe God wants to speak to you directly? Raise your hand. Every hand in this building should go up. Number two, the second part of tuning in is this. You have to come to him. You have to make room to spend time with him. God has called you to come to the throne of grace. If you don't put yourself in a position to be in his presence, you're going to have a hard time hearing his voice. And we're going to talk a little bit about the noise that's out there. There's a lot of noise in this world today, and you have to come into his presence so you can tune in to hear him. And number three under this, don't be shy. God has asked us to come boldly to the throne of grace. God set up the parameters and told us how he wanted us to come into his presence. Then he said, when you come to me, I want you to come into my throne room with boldness. What does the term boldly mean? God wants us to come to him and be frank and speak openly. He wants an unrestrained, full outpouring of your heart. He wants you to come in and just lay it all out and hold nothing back when you come into his presence. Today, uh, we're going to talk about cutting through the noise. Cutting through the noise. Write this in. I think it's in your notes. Life can be loud. How many of you would agree with that? Life can be loud. It screams at us from every direction. Life can be intimidating. It can be confusing. It can be discouraging. It can be noisy. It can be loud. We're all familiar with the story of David and Goliath. And I want to start here as a springboard into the message today. There are just two lines from the story that I want to read to you, but it's going to paint a picture of, of what I mean when I say life can be loud. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn there, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 8 and verse 16. Here's what it says. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel. Verse 16. For 40 days... 
the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. We all face Goliaths in our lives. What is Goliath? Goliath is that thing or that person that is intimidating, big, domineering, consuming, overwhelming. And Goliath, when he comes into your life, he takes his stand and he shouts at you. Notice that he shouts. He becomes the loudest voice in your life. What is shouting? What can it do? Listen, how many of you know if you're in a situation and somebody is shouting at you, how many of you know that is an intimidating thing to be a part of? If somebody is taking their stand, they're puffed up, they're coming at you and they're shouting, they're taking a dominant position and they're trying to back you down. You see, we all have Goliaths that shout at us. Not only did Goliath stand and shout, the Bible says he stood and shouted day after day, and he did it in the morning, and he did it in the evening. What is the, what is the type that we have here? Here's the type and shadow for all of us. There was no relief. This giant would shout in the morning and in the evening and all day long, day after day after day. And how many of you know there are voices and circumstances in your life that are shouting at you over and over and you can find no relief from them. There are circumstances in your life that shout at you. Some of you that are here today, you've received a bad doctor's report. You're physically not doing well and it shouts at you from morning to evening and every day you give it up, again it stands and it shouts at you. There's some of you here today, you are facing financial situations that are about to ruin you and every day that you get up, you are greeted again by that giant of finances shouting day in and day out and there's no relief. Maybe you're here and it's an addiction in your life. And that addiction, every single day you get up, you're faced with it again. Maybe it's pornography or substance abuse. And every day that, that addiction shouts at you. Maybe it's social media. You can't seem to put it down. It demands your time and attention. And every day it shouts at you when you get out of bed. Or maybe it's the giant of your identity. It shouts things like this at you. You're not good enough. You'll never amount to anything. You're a loser. You're ugly. You're a nobody. Nobody cares about you. It's hopeless. Things will never get better. Here is what we all know in this place. Every person beyond a shadow of a doubt in this room, you know what those voices are like. They are loud, they are noisy, and they are intimidating. For many of you, the voices are so loud, you can't get a good night's sleep. Those voices don't stop during the day. You go to lay your head on that pillow at night, and in fact, that could be the loudest. When you put your head down, that enemy comes in, and that voice begins to shout, and you're restless, you're tossing, and you're turning. Why do you think so many people are drugged out in America with prescriptions, drugs? They're trying to find some kind of relief from the shouting that's going on in their life. And in fact, there are some of you here today, you go to bed, and you wake up more, uh, more exhausted than when you went to sleep. Elijah was a man that understood what the Goliath in his life was all about, what the shouting in his life was all about. So I want to springboard from imagining Goliath shouting at you to looking at this Goliath in Elijah's life. Turn with me to 1 Kings 19. It is from this story we're going to learn how to cut out the noise so we can hear the voice of God in our lives. A lot of us are familiar with this story. Elijah had just defeated the prophets of Baal in dramatic fashion. Do you remember the story? He called out the 450 prophets of Baal and he said, I want to have a showdown with you guys. And the showdown is going to be this. Whoever's God is really God, either Baal is God and all the gods you claim, or my God is God. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an oxen, we're going to cut it up, we're going to build an altar, we're going to put the oxen on top of the altar, and whoever's God consumes it with fire is the true God of the earth. And then Elijah says, hey, and I'll let you guys go ahead and go first. So the prophets of Baal get out there, and you know, they 
begin to shout. They begin to dance. The Bible says they even begin to cut themselves. And Elijah, this guy's kind of funny. He was mocking them a little bit. He would come back every once in a while to check in how things are going. And, and he even asked this, says, hey man, where is your God? Is he too busy in the bathroom to come take care of things? I mean, this guy was, he was in, you know, he, he didn't mind shouting out a little bit towards these guys. They finally finish up and nothing happens. And then Elijah steps up. Do you remember? He says, pour water all over it. I'll pour some more water. No, I want a little more water. Fill up the trench all the way around. Drench it as, as much as you can. And then he calls out to the living God. And then fire rained from heaven and consumed everything, left nothing. And Elijah's God proved that he was the God of the universe. Awesome story. Elijah is standing there to witness this very moment. And then what they do is they round up all of the prophets of Baal, take them down into the valley, and they kill 450 false prophets right there. After this event, the word gets back to Queen Jezebel, who was married to King Ahab. She found out what Elisha had done through her husband. Let's pick up the story. Second, uh, 1 Kings 19, verse 1 and 2. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow, I don't make your life like that of one of them. Let's stop there for a moment. I find it interesting that she's calling on those same gods of Baal to make her like one of them. I don't know what Elijah got so afraid of. He just saw what God had already done, but she speaks this out to him. And as soon as Elijah hears this from Jezebel, it becomes the loudest voice in his life. This is Elijah's giant standing and shouting at him. The voice of the enemy took over in Elijah's life. How do I know? Look at Elijah's actions after this giant begins to speak. Picking up at verse 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, look at what the noise in Elijah's life did to him. It brought fear. It put him on the run and drove him into the wilderness. And how many of you know that's what the voice of the enemy can do to us? This is what happens in our lives when the giant shows up and he stands and he takes his stand and he begins to shout. That noise can bring fear, cause us to run and drive us into the wilderness. Now I say wilderness is a type of this to me. Wilderness is confusion. A type of confusion. That confusion is, God, where are you? What is happening? Why aren't you delivering me? What is going on in my life? Notice that Elisha was separated from his servant and he went alone. How many of you know when the enemy is shouting at you, one of the greatest things he wants to do is he wants to isolate you, cut you off from the body and get you alone. That's right. The enemy wants to get you by yourself so that he can shout. He can, he can cut you off. He can cause confusion in your life. You see, once I, uh, Elisha is isolated, he's afraid. He's confused. He's alone. Look what happens to him. 1 Kings 19 verse 4. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. Who's ever been there? You're afraid. You're alone. You're confused. The giants are shouting at you. You're exhausted. You're discouraged. And like Elijah in that alone moment, you've said, I've had enough. I can't take it anymore. I'm too tired. I can't go on. Folks, I want you to know that the great prophet Elisha, at this very moment of his life, he was suicidal, he was depressed, he was confused, and the only voice he could hear was the voice of his circumstances shouting at him. 
So Elijah is so exhausted. He can't just, he can't carry on anymore. He falls asleep and he awakens to an angel that is there. First Kings 19, five and six. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. As you follow this story, you'll see the angel repeated this a second time with Elijah. Notice the first initial answer the Lord brought into Elijah's life had nothing to do with anything spiritual. It was all about Elijah being exhausted, run down, and lacking proper nutrition. Did you notice that? It was the first thing that God dealt with in Elijah's life. He says, here's what I want you to do. Eat some food, drink some water, get another nap. You are completely exhausted physically. The reason many of us are overrun by giants, write this in, is because we are run down by life. I'm gonna let that sink in for a moment. The reason many of us are overrun by giants is because we are run down by life. We are stressed out, we're tired, we never get the rest we need, we're not eating right, we never take a break, and we go, 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 and when you're in that state and your body begins to wear down, and then the wheels fall off and giants show up, you're exhausted, you're emotionally drained, and then the enemy shows up to shout at you, what do you think is going to happen? You see, God first dealt with Elijah's physical exhaustion before he ever tries to speak to him. You guys know how it is when you're feeling overwhelmed by the giants. And on top of that, you've run yourself ragged. I want to tell you, there's no way when you're in that state that you're in a position to really hear what God wants to communicate to you. He might just be saying to some of you today, and listen to me, some of you that are here today, you just need some rest. You got to quit going. You got to quit burning the candle at both ends. You need to get some rest. You need to eat right. You need to take a little bit of a break. And when you do that, you're going to start to put yourself in a position to hear what God wants to say to you. Sometimes that's God's solution. Sometimes God's solution is get some rest. After Elijah was rested and he had some water and he had some sleep and some food, God had a plan. God led Elijah to Mount Horeb, where he, that mountain is called the mountain of God. So Elijah goes up onto the mountain. Let's look at 1 Kings 19 verse 9. He goes up onto the mountain and it says, there he went into a cave and spent the night. How many of you know when God begins to speak to you, he wants your undivided attention. He wants you tuned in to him. So there's a couple of things that I want you to notice from these verses. God brought Elijah to the mountain and set him in a cave. Here it is. The mountain represents God calling us out of the valley where the giants live and up into his presence. The mountain is a place where we meet with God. So my question is, where is it that you meet with God? Where is it where you come out of the valley and the busyness of life? Where is that safe place where you get into the presence of God? What does that look like for you? Where is the place that you go to a higher level into his presence? When God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, he told Moses very early on what his ultimate objective was going to be with the children of Israel. Exodus chapter three, verse 12, it says, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, listen, you will worship God on this mountain. He's saying the greatest thing that you're ever going to be able to do is move into relationship and worship and be in the presence of God almighty. That was the objective of leading them out of the land of Egypt. Has anybody ever heard the term 
or experienced this in your life where you've been lost in the presence of God? Who's ever been there before? Where you've just, you've got into his presence and you've lost track of time, dimension. You've lost track of what's going on around you. Who's ever been in that place where you've been lost in the presence of God? You don't care about anything else. You don't care about what is happening. You are, you are caught up to another place. That's what it means when we are getting alone and going to another place with the Lord. Not only did he call Elijah up the mountain, he had him go into the cleft of a rock or a cave. A cave that looked out over the valley below. The cave is a place that represents no distractions. How many of you know if I'm in a cave up on a mountain, I can't see anything to the left, I can't see anything to the right, I can't see anything behind me, all I can see is what's in front of me. And that's exactly where God wanted Elijah to be, because he had his full attention. And how many of you know, when you're in a cave, you don't get very good cell service in a cave. You can't get cable TV in the cave. When you're in the cave... When you're in that alone place, you were cut off from all of those distractions. You're cut off from all the outside voices. There you are, alone with God in his presence. Man, do we need more caves in our lives. We're so busy. We're so distracted. I believe it's one of the best tools the enemy has today. In, 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 in this century today, one of the best tools the enemy has is distractions of technology. It is one of the greatest tools that he has to keep people from getting in to the presence of God Almighty. If you were here for our revive service, how many came for revive service? There was a theme. Do you remember a theme? There were some themes that came out of that. And almost every speaker, remember they talked about us being, not just us, but the world and people in the world today as believers. Remember they talked about how we're distracted by technology and we need to get back to seeking God again. It was a theme that all of them brought to us. We need to get away from the distractions. So God was saying to Elijah, I'm calling you up into my presence, away from the distractions of life, because I have something I want to say. So it's here in this moment. He's rested. He's had some food. He drank water. He's up on a mountain alone with God. He's in a cleft. All distractions are gone. And look what happens. Verse nine. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. I love the lesson in this story. I love what it teaches about cutting through the noise in our lives so we can hear the voice of God. God brings Elijah into his presence on the mountain. He's in the cleft of the rock. And God does a demonstration of his power. Could you imagine what it would have been like to be there with Elijah looking out and seeing the power of God show up in the wind and crashing the mountains around? Could you imagine how awesome that would have been? Could you imagine of what it was like to see the fire and the earthquake come down? Could you imagine what that had been like? But notice it was at the end of this display of power, the writer writes these words. The Lord was not in the wind. The Lord was not in the earthquake. The Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a what? Came a what? After the fire came a, gent not just a whisper, but a gentle whisper. We oftentimes are looking for God in the big displays. We're looking for God in the big miracle. 
We're looking for God in the dramatic. But notice how God communicated with Elijah. He came to him in a gentle whisper. There are several things we can learn from this passage. I want to start out by asking a question. What do you have to do in order to hear a whisper? What do you have to do if you're going to hear a whisper? There are four things that that we can be taught about hearing the voice of God and hearing this whisper. Four things that I want you to write down. Number one, write it in. You have to draw near to the person. In order to hear what somebody is trying to say in a whisper, how many of you know you have to draw near to them? You can't do it from a great distance or it's no longer a whisper. Have you ever seen two friends or two people that are in love sharing whispers back and forth with one another? They're sitting there and they're cupping their hands and they're sharing in one another's ears, talking back and forth. What does this teach us? God is teaching this. In order to cut out all the noise, we have to draw near to him. What does scripture say? James 4 verse 8, draw near to God and he will what? Draw near to you. We have to come quietly into his presence, away from all the noise and the distractions. Not only do we need to draw near, but here it is, write it in, number two, in order to hear a whisper, you have to lean in. You gotta lean in. You know, when you get get to hear a whisper, it's not just coming close. How many of you know, if I'm gonna hear a whisper, I gotta lean into somebody. I got to get extra close to them. Whispers can't be heard from distances. We have to close the gap. We have to draw very close and lean in. We have to lean in during those times. Listen, when the giants are shouting at us, the Lord is saying, lean into me, draw near to me, lend your ear to me, and I will speak to you. Number three, what else? Here it is. A whisper is a personal message just for you. Write that down. When we whisper to somebody, that message is just for them. It's not for everybody else. It's personal. It's intimate. And this is exactly what God wants to do to us. He says, come on. I know it's noisy out there. Come close to me. Lean into me. And I'm going to whisper something that's personally for you. And lastly, (laughs) here it is. To hear a whisper, you can't be talking. This is hard for some of us. Even when you get alone in God's presence, you're the one doing all the talking. And it's okay. God said, come, pour out your heart. Give me everything you got. That's okay. You can pour it all out. But here's what I want to tell you. There's got to be a time where you close that mouth and tighten those lips and sit and listen. There's got to be a time where you're not talking anymore. If you want God to respond, if you want to hear his whisper, you need to close your mouth and not say anything and say, Lord, here am I. What do you want to say? And then just sit and linger in his presence and hear what he's trying to communicate. Some of you don't want to be quiet because you're afraid of what he might say. If you're going to hear the voice of God, you have to quit talking. And then God will speak with a gentle whisper. It's important to remember that God is calling you to a quiet place so he can whisper to you. I want to close with an illustration today that will help us understand what we're talking about. If you remember this last week, we talked about how God has made a way. He wants us to come into the inner chamber. He's drawing us. The veil has been torn. And so I'm going to need a few volunteers. Eric, would you come up here? Ron, would you come up here uh, on the stage here? I need two manly men, burly guys, and these are my two. I want you to stand side by side and face, face, facing me. Ron, come over here next to, next to Eric. Face, you guys shoulder to shoulder face me. Cross your arms. Yeah, that's good. That, that's good right there, isn't it? That's, that's a couple of men right there. I like that. Now, 
uh, I need... I need either a father and son that's here or a father and daughter. Father, son, father, daughter. Do I have anybody in service that's father, son, or father, daughter that could come up here? Okay. All right, Joe, hold on now. Son has got to stay, stay down here, right here. Are you going to be okay with this illustration, bud? Okay, you're going to be right there. Joe, you're going to come up here. And Joe, you're going to stand on this side of these two burly guys right here okay all right now i hope this is this is okay could you stand up for a second are you going to be okay if i have some people shout at you you'd be cool with that you you love you love shouting okay well we're good i need i need i need 10 10 people 10 people to come and surround my young man right here Come on. Nobody, okay. Joe, this is a problem. Joe, uh, mom, come, come, come stand. Mom, you come stand here, okay? Okay, mom, stand in with son. Nobody wants to stand and shout at your son. You know what I'm saying? I did, but you know, Joe, you had to bring the littlest guy in the building, right? Everybody's feeling bad. All right, you guys surround him all the way around him. Yep, I know. This is intimidating, but this is, what, this is what giants look like. Now, our young man here is going through life, and he carries with him, like all of us do, the giants, the giants of fear, the giants of intimidation. Maybe it's the giants of finance. Maybe it's the giants of addiction. Whatever it may be, and those giants shout. No matter where he goes, the giants are shouting. So what I'm going to ask you to do, giants, giants, you look at me, giants. I know he's going to be okay. He's gave, we have permission. So I need my giants to be giants. In fact, this is a good, this is a good illustrator, right? We feel very small. They feel very big. So giants on the count of three, all I want you to do, give me a shout as loud as you can. As you're looking at the young man, you just shout. You don't have to say anything. Just shout. Ready? One, two, three, shout loud. Yeah. All right. Good. Needed to plug your ears, didn't you? Now. Here's what we have. You start to walk, and giants, you're going to walk with him. We're going to walk down this way. Giants stay surrounding him. Young man, come on. Walk to, don't let him out of the circle. No, 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 no. He stays in the middle of the circle. Now, no matter where he goes, the giants are with him. The giants are shouting. I want you guys to come up on the platform. Hey, gi giants. Okay. All right, come up onto the platform. All right, you guys could quit shouting for a second. Come on up here. Man, I got some good giants. Last service, they didn't do anything. They're nothing like these giants. All right, stand right here. So this is the giants of life. They are with you wherever you go throughout your work day. When you lay your head down at night, no matter where you go, the giants are shouting at you, constantly coming at you. But listen, God calls us. He says, come unto me. And when we come unto him, scripture says, the God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So here's what we have. Giants, come with us a little further. Come on, giants. Come right here. Come right here. Come right here. Okay, stop. These two, here's the guards that, that God has placed that stand over your heart and your mind. And as you come into the presence of God, there's something miraculous that happens. He guards your heart and mind, which is in Christ Jesus. So as I walk through, through Christ into the presence of God, these guards close the door. Come on, giants. Come right up here. You're not going any further. You're right here. Now, when I come into the presence of God, there is a peace which transcends doesn't make any sense transcends all understanding I walk through the guards are posted you will not go beyond this point now it's here it's here right what is God saying God is saying you are getting shouted at everywhere you go. You're shouting in your own mind. You're shouting when you get up, shouting when you go to bed. I'm not going to shout at you. Come over here, child. Come into my presence and let me crawl up into my lap. Dad, pick him up. Crawl up into my lap. And I've got something I want to whisper into your ear. 
and God begins to whisper, you're my child. You have a destiny, my son. I have called you. He doesn't want to shout. He wants to give you relief from the shouting. He has called you into the throne room, into his presence, where you find relief from the giants that are trying to drive you crazy. And here's what else. When this young man, as he comes into the presence of God, when he believes, when he starts to believe he's a giant killer, and when that really comes on him and he quits believing the lies, he will put those voices to flight by the power of the name of Jesus. But listen, you can't do this just walking through life and letting the giants rule you. You've got to get alone. Listen, but once you begin to hear the, the, the soft whisper of Lord, the Lord in the quiet place, you'll begin to hear him in the loud place. So no, no matter where I am, now that I'm tuned in and I've spent time with him, no matter where I walk, I will know who I am. I will know my destiny. And when those voices try to come on me, I'll say in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you fear. In the name of Jesus, the finances are all in the Lord's hands. Glory to God. He's going to take care of it. Sickness, I'm not afraid of you. My God heals all of my diseases. I put you to flight in Jesus' name. You see, you learn all of those things in the quiet place. It's here. And God gives you a reprieve because he posts the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Those voices cannot come into the inner chamber because it's here where you crawl up into the arms of your loving father who is going to speak to you and whisper to you and he calls you by name. Can we give these guys a hand? This was awesome. Amen, amen. I have these headphones here. They're not headphones. They're actually ear protection. You know, I have a dog that I'm training as a hunting dog. And I needed some ear protection. It had been a long time since I've been out hunting. And, you know, normal ear protection that you get and you put on, it just kind of, uh, it cuts out everything. You can't hear what anybody's saying. It protects your ears and it cuts everything out. But when I went to the store to get some ear protection for me, because when I go out and we come on a bird, I have a, a blank gun and I shoot it in the air and I don't want it to damage my ears. So as I was looking around, I came across these and I was amazed at how far technology has come. This, this ear protection here has a little dial on the side and I began to read up on it and it says, when you turn this on and turn it up, it says it has a microphone in it. Don't I look cool? <laughs> when I turn this microphone on, what it does, ooh, that's... Uh, cause a little problem here, isn't it? I'm going to take that off. When I put the micro, when I put this on, this microphone amplifies the voices that I need to hear that are around me. It amplifies people that I'm out hunting with or somebody that's out at a distance. It'll pick their voice up and it amplifies the voices that I need to hear while at the same time, it rejects any sounds that will bring harm to me. So any sound that is too loud, too overbearing, it cuts it out and I can't hear it, but it amplifies the voices that I need to hear. And I said, oh Lord, is that what we need in the church today? Lord, when I walk through, I need to put on my spiritual headphones, my spiritual earmuffs that only allow me to hear the good voices of what God is speaking. And it tunes out the voice of the giants so that I can't hear them anymore. And I am wearing these so that every time you think about this message, you remember Pastor Mark standing on the stage wearing these things, looking silly on stage. And you'll remember, you'll say, Lord, give me those spiritual ears you're talking about. Give me the ears that tune in to the whisper and cut out the giant's voice so that I can no longer hear the voice of negativity. Lord, let me hear the gentle whispers of your Holy Spirit today amplify that voice in a noisy world. There are a lot of you, man, you're living a noisy life and you're getting beat down by the voice and voices and God is calling you into his inner chamber. Come up. 
lean into me. I've got something I want to tell you. And so as the worship team comes today, and as we close out this morning, we're just going to have you stand where you are in just a moment. You'd say, Pastor, I want that. I just want to lean in to where I can hear God's voice. I want to be able to tune out the voice of the giants. If that's your heart, if that's your desire, just stand right where you are. And, and we're going to close out with this song right here. And I just want you to lift your, your hands and your hearts to heaven as we sing together to close this out.